Um, I, I have a rather difficult task here. I have to kind of follow all the nice things that were said, and particularly the inspiration, the positivity. Uh, but I'm going to ask some rather hard questions, and I do not for one minute want you all to think that I'm negative. I'm an incorrigible optimist. Uh, those who know me will know that I can never say no, and I think everything's possible. But I do think there's an industry growing around uh, inspiration, which is quite often surrounded with hubris, uh, meaning that we go around saying, it's all going to be okay. I call it the OT thing, the Oprah thing. Uh, <laughs> Let's get on a couch, pretend it's all okay, hug a few people, write a book, and we'll save the world. I think it's a bit more complex than that. I, I'm not an expert, so I'm going to share with you some thoughts that I have and try and leave you to find the answers. My big thing is that intellectual dishonesty is today one of the, hu the biggest risks that we face uh, in the world. So many of us want to do the right thing. We want to do good. But we're scared to go into the dark room and ask the hard questions. And I think intellectual dishonesty is something we need to challenge. And I often am asked at, at, at conferences I speak at, what do you think are the greatest risks? And if I'm with panelists from the US, et cetera, usually the Al-Qaeda thing comes up, it's peak oil, et cetera. And I usually say it's intellectual dishonesty. So I'd like to start by asking you to bear with me don't think of me as a pessimist or a negative person. I'm very positive. But I do think we ought to ask ourselves some rather hard questions. As far as what I do, I'm told that you know, you're not supposed to advertise. But if you think I'm, I'm just negative, please go to my website. I do some positive things. But I want to ask you some hard questions. OK. Um, some of these hard questions would be what I call slaying cows in front of Brahmins. So if there are any Brahmins here, please, no jihad, no fatwa on me, OK? Uh, and the idea is to get us to really understand that if we don't ask these questions, the innovations that we so loosely talk about, that, that horrible word, uh, just gets thrown about as though it's so easy. And I wanted to ask you to sort of think about these things a bit more in a more sort of difficult manner and ask ourselves, why is it that some of the most pressing problems in the world have been so elusive? Why has it been so difficult? So first, intellectual dishonesty with institutional handcuffs. One of the biggest sort of troubles that we have. People come with institutional handcuffs. They can never say what they think. I work with a lot of companies who talk about sustainability, very rarely able to speak very op openly about what really the issues are. I'll not mention any, any companies. The other thing is I think we get all stuck in polite conversations. And it's so easy. We all want to be polite. We want to respect. But we need to move beyond poli polite conversations and really ask ourselves, have those discussions. I think inspiration is important. But I think sometimes we need to get angry. How many of you are angry? Good. Please, be angry. But don't take that anger in a negative way and impose it on others. But I don't see how we can change anything if we're not angry. But make it a positive thing if that's not a contradiction in terms. I want to just say that you know, the Asian development model that we've had for the last uh, 50 years has been one that has been rooted in a sort of post-industrial economic model that I believe has reached its ceiling. If you look at what the economists in the world are telling us today about the world we're in, it says that for the world economy to revive, please, Asians, consume. I know the Japanese know this. You're all being told, consume, consume, consume. China's being told, consume, consume, consume. The Indians are being told, please, consume. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that if we, the developing world, consume, and I don't want to be divisive here, uh, like the Western world, there is just not enough to go around. There is simply not enough to go around. There are those who will tell us that technology and finance will solve all of these problems. It simply won't. So let me get into some of the hard questions. If 500 million Chinese today who live on two, three dollars, and the Chinese government's aspiration is to lift them out of poverty, started to get wealthy, what do Chinese people do when they get a bit wealthier? They go and eat outside. Sorry? Eat fish. OK, first. So if they, 500 million Chinese started to eat fish, like you and me, the privileged lot, the oceans would be empty. 
I know a fisheries expert here who would say, vouch for that too. The oceans would be empty. No technology, no finance will solve that problem. But who is to say to the Chinese, they can't have their fish? And I'm sorry, but my dear Japanese friends, you should have kept sashimi a secret in this country. You should have never sold it to the rest of the world uh, because we do not deserve to eat sushi because we don't appreciate how fine that taste is. So the, sushi, so, the, so the tuna is going down because now all of us eat sushi, even my dear Indian friends. Second, cars. India, car ownership today, 10 per thousand people. I hope my friends in Toyota won't be offended. Um, car ownership in the OECD countries, 700 per thousand. The Chinese have about 60 per thousand. We're being told now, please buy cars. And I know in America and Germany, they're saying, buy one, get one free. OK? <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, and, and the Brits, who don't have a car industry, are making the same deal. So <laughs> they'll be buying Toyota. But if the Chinese and Indians have car ownership levels like the OECD, which they could reach at current growth rates in 20, 30 years, do you know how many cars there'll be in the world? Just in China and India, there could be 1.5 to 2 billion cars. We need more cars like I need a hole in my head. 1.5 to 2 billion cars in China and India, according to estimates, will require the entire OPEC crude oil output to be shipped to China and India just to drive the cars. This is not going to happen. There will be a disruption. How that disruption takes place, we don't know. So th sec third question. Carbon dioxide. Today, we all demonize China as being the world's largest emitter of CO2. It's a misrepresentation of the facts. Chinese per capita emissions of CO2 are about a quarter of OECD uh, countries. The Indians are about a tenth. The Chinese will not stop producing more CO2. The problem is, a lot of Chinese CO2 is actually laundered CO2. We have taken our factories from the first world and put them in the third world and said, you make it, but we will accuse you of pollution and, CO and, and, and carbon dioxide. It's laundering of CO2. The reality, though, is there is going to just be more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Though I agree, I think the Chinese are going to take steps. And I'll come to why the Chinese can do it more than anybody else, because of the form of government.